G'day Legends, Blake here with another video and have you ever thought about breeding Corydoras or have you picked some up with the hopes to breed them and you're struggling a little bit? Well today this video is going to be the answer for you. I'm going to run you through everything you're going to need to know to breed everybody's favourite catfish. Let's jump straight into the video. So to get started, Corydoras catfish is a pretty big family of fish. You've probably seen them from any fish store between big box stores to you know, specific awesome uh, local fish stores that we all love. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors and patterns. Things uh, as small as pygmy corridors or Histatus corridors or Hebrosis corridors and as big as emerald corridors or brocus even though they're not technically quarries anymore but they get quite large even like a bronze quarry or anything within that Corridorus aenus family. You're gonna get pretty big you know like like yay big for a big female. So um, you can get basically whatever your um, heart desires. Now for the most part breeding corals isn't that tricky of a process. You can see I've got some couple of month old fry here from my Venezuelan quarries. But um, there are a few little tips and tricks to know which I'll run you through. First things first is maturity. I think you're going to want for a general rule of thumb to leave at least six months before they're going to get to breeding size. A lot of the quarries that you find at your big box stores are not at that stage yet. So you really notice it if you go to a local fish store, for example, you see some big mamas in there and you think, okay, we're in business here. And that's a great time to pounce because they're really likely to breed as soon as you take them home to your um, home aquarium. For me, and I've bred quarries many, many times, I find that they respond best to changes in aquarium conditions. So the day that you bring them home from the aquarium store, they're gonna be exposed to a whole variety of different water parameters because yours are gonna be different to that of your fish store. So that sort of drastic change is actually something that's really good for quarries. It might stress out other more sensitive fish, but when it comes to these armored catfish, they're super hardy and they actually really thrive in that sort of environment. However, if we are gonna pick up some smaller ones and grow them out for a period of time until they reach that maturity, then of course we can't replicate that. So I like to do a cool water water change to, to trigger spawning in that event. And a lot of people are really scared by adding in water. That's a couple of degrees either side of their current aquarium temperature, but it's really nothing to worry about at all. There's even been times where I've just um, changed water directly from an outdoor hose, which is gonna be way colder than anything that's gonna be experienced here in the fishery. Now, why this is so successful is really quite simple. It's because it's replicating a heavy rainfall event. And you know, over a long period of years of evolution, quarries have adapted to realize that rainfall equals more food available, more habitat to hide in, and it's just better to raise your babies in. It doesn't make sense to utilize all the protein and energy uh, that is hard to get in the wild to just raise their babies in periods of distress and eventually lose them. However, simulating rainfall isn't going to be the only thing that the, is going to be required to get them into the breeding mode. And heaps of people have tried this and got a little bit annoyed when they haven't instantly had eggs. Now, of course, it's really important to condition your fish properly and Corridor's favorite food in the whole world is worms. They absolutely love anything from blood worms, black worms, uh, whatever you can find. If it's frozen, that's good. If it's live, that's better. If it's freeze dried, that will still work. But just anything that's gonna be high protein, worm-like and sink to the bottom, that's really gonna get your corridors to be fat and happy and have that real excess protein so that they can start to create some eggs and uh, milt. I was gonna show you my stir by quarries, but can't even see into the tank at the moment. There's that much algae on the glass, so I'll clean that up while we go. And the last thing is really just to make sure that you have a good group. Corridors are a schooling fish. They don't really like to just be in small groups of twos and threes. I like to keep them in groups of six, eight, 10 is better. 15 is great. Just kind of the most amount that you can fit in your tank without creating a huge bio load, which is then gonna affect your water quality. When it comes to corridors, really the more you get, the better they're gonna be. Now, in an ideal world, I'd also say more females to males is gonna be better. However, at the size that most people pick them up at, it's a bit of a gamble, and it's not as big of a risk with, as it is with other fish, where males are really gonna fight and bicker or anything like that. It's really just that you can have 
one male fertilizing multiple sets of eggs. So you only really need uh, one male, but you can have as many females as you like. You can finally see the stir buys in there. It's still not great viewing, but these are one of my absolute favorite. And you can see here some of the really cool patterns that you can get when it comes to Corydoras. So as you can see, it's pretty simple to breed Corys, although definitely since there is such a wide variety in the species, uh, there are going to be certain quarries that are going to be easier to breed than others. So if you are a beginner and you just want to you know, have fun breeding a new type of fish in a different way, well, I would suggest going with either bronze quarries, pepper quarries or panda quarries as kind of the top three easiest quarries to breed. Uh, other than that, it's kind of going to get a little bit more difficult. Pygmy quarries are also great if you want something different because they don't really eat their eggs that much. So you can just kind of leave them all be and just have a good time with it. So luckily the other day, my Venezuelan quarries bred and I was uh, happy to catch all of that on film. So now that we know the basics of conditioning and what you need to set up the tank, now it's time to show you through the process of harvesting the eggs and growing up the actual fish. Okay, so here we are. This is my black Venezuelan Corydoras tank here. Uh, it's just rained last night. So that's generally what happens is when it rains, the barometric pressure drops. And if you do a cool water water change, like I did in here yesterday, you'll most likely find that on your glass will be these strange looking eggs. So there's three little batches here at the front. There's another one here, but you gotta be quick because as you can see, there's a snail already trying to eat them. So just going to pause right now. Corridor's egg harvesting is definitely a quick game. So what we want to do is get them off the glass into a separate container to raise them in safety. So corridors and other things love to eat quarry eggs. And because they get laid on the glass, they're usually out in the middle of nowhere, sort of um, ready to be eaten. So the best method I've found is to get a brand new razor blade. You want it to be as sharp as possible not even used once, I think. And you just go under and sort of scoop them off. So you, you, you're just holding the uh, razor blade firmly on the glass, going through under, being careful not to lift it off the glass at all because you might accidentally uh, score the eggs if you do that. And we're just going along and collecting them. And as you can see right there, we've got our quarry eggs. Now, if you feel quarry eggs, they're usually pretty hard. They can handle being sort of rolled around and things like that. Some people prefer to collect them just with their hands, just with their fingers. But I find that with my fingers, I tend to uh, accidentally crush them when I do that. So I prefer to use the razor blade method for this. Okay, now things have calmed down a little bit. You can see my two containers here. This is the specimen container that I collected the eggs in. And this is the container that I'm going to hopefully hatch them out in. Now, when trying to hatch out eggs, there's two main things that you're going to want to use. I like to use methylene blue. You don't really need much of it at all. Just a couple of drops, four or five drops. I've got liquid methylene blue. You can also get powderized versions, but very, very good thing to keep on hand. The second thing is just going to be aeration. Or I guess clean water is also pretty important. You don't want any debris in there because essentially what we're trying to do is um, limit the possibility of fungus. So aeration and methylene blue are going to be the two things. And then I'm just going to tip the eggs in there. Can't really see, but they're here at the back. There's about, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 eggs, not a heap, but be enough to hopefully hatch some out. Of course, make sure they don't get stuck in the original container. And that's it. These are good to go now. So hopefully in about seven to 10 days, they should hatch out and we'll see what we got.
As a first food, I fed these micro worms here, which are a little tiny nematode that climb up the edge of a container. I've got a video actually on how to make this. This is a poor example at the moment because moment, it's gone a bit moldy. But what I do is I just get a little paintbrush, scoop some off the side and place that into the container where my baby Corys are. And this food is great for the very first day that they hatch out all the way up to sort of two, three weeks old when they can start to um, forage a little bit more and they can handle more powderized foods and things like that. I'm a bit wary on feeding them baby brine shrimp, even when they're at the size when they could take it, like these fish are here. I've heard that they find it really hard to, diff, uh, to digest the shells of the actual brine shrimp, so I kind of avoid that. I prefer worms anyway, so uh, the microworms do just fine and they love to eat on those little guys. And they take to powder pretty fine as well, so at this stage, I basically just feed powder every day and that's got a mixture of different foods in it anyway. So um, it's pretty much easy street once they get to this size. So there you go guys, that's how simple it can be to breed Corydoras. All it takes is a cool water water change, a decent group, enough females and condition them up with any sort of wormy goodness that you can. If this video has helped you out and it's given you a bit more insight into this process, Hopefully, if you're tentative about it, you can go out there with confidence and pick up that little group of Corys to start breeding for yourself. It's super fun and I definitely recommend it for anyone. If it has helped you out, it always helps me out too. Smash like, hit subscribe and all that fun stuff. And other than that, I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.